If we take any video game and break it down to its fundamental principles, it could be described as a contained system. It has its own rules, spaces, and obstacles. The player engages with this system to learn its rules, traverse its spaces, meet its challenges, and hopefully emerge victorious. Of course, there's a lot more to building a character-focused video game than simply throwing together these core ingredients, as any game developer worth their salt will tell you. There is nuance to everything. Who is the playable character? How can players begin to empathise with them? What kind of rules do the player and the system have to adhere to? How difficult can or should these rules be for players to understand? What's the nature of the game space? Is it two-dimensional? Three-dimensional? Perhaps something in between? And what manner of obstacles should the player have to face? Puzzles? Enemies? Traps? On what terms should they have to deal with these obstacles? This list of game design variables will grow exponentially the more you consider how to make your game different or interesting, from the various mechanisms it might use to the narrative elements it could draw upon. But let's take a few steps back to the basic levels of interaction between the player and the system. In many video game genres, it's a process of direct confrontation. What various academics and game designers have referred to as push. In the Stealth Letters, Nels Anderson described push gameplay as being centred around fixed event scenarios. Example, the player's character walks into a space, enemies appear, and begin to converge on the player's position, firing bullets or swinging swords or whatever, and the player is expected to overcome them and get to the next area using the skill set, tools, and rules within the system. Whether or not the player succeeds will be determined by their abilities to adapt, to draw upon their knowledge of the game's rules, and to use their character's various skills. In this example, the player is pushing against the system, and the system is pushing back against the player. We can see good examples of push-based gameplay dynamics between players and systems in first-person shooters, role-playing games, Spectacle Fighters Platformers Action Adventures Even Sports Simulators Many other genres revolve around push-based gameplay dynamics as well, these are just a few of the more obvious examples. Remember, we're talking about fundamental interactions between the player and the system. Whether the player's character is a professional footballer, a mage, a marine, or a blue hedgehog, the principles remain the same. The player pushes against the system, and the system pushes against the player. This is a legitimate design framework that game developers have used to construct entertaining, challenging, and thoughtful experiences for decades, and there is nothing wrong with building video games within this framework. But stealth games are different in their fundamental design. In stealth games, the push dynamic between the player and the system is deliberately skewed in the system's favour. What this basically means is that, in a stealth game, the player is generally vulnerable to the overwhelming force of the system's push. The idea of pushing against the system is actively discouraged in stealth games, with players being conditioned, through punishing difficulty if not outright failure, to avoid direct conflict where possible. So we can see how the gameplay dynamic of a stealth game is quite distinct from that of many other video game genres. The natural question to ask is, if you are designing a video game where the player is being conditioned not to directly push against the system, what is their primary means of beating the system's challenges? Well, the player does have one significant advantage in a stealth game. The system begins, and potentially can remain, in a passive state. In other words, the system is unaware of the player's location by default. Remember that scenario I described earlier, where the player walks into a new space and enemies immediately start attacking them? In stealth games, things play out a little differently. 
In order to take steps to push against the player, the system has to first be triggered from a passive state into an active state by the player's actions within the game space. Put simply, those enemies in the room need to detect the player before they can begin attacking. Under these conditions, the player begins with an advantage over the system because the system doesn't know where the player is. But it's an advantage that can be instantly lost if they are detected by any of the system's obstacles. So it's in the player's interests to remain invisible for as long as possible. While undetected, the player is free to move around the system, bypassing obstacles, traversing spaces and lining up their objectives. If the power of a stealth game system lies in pushing against the player when it's in an active state, then the player's power lies in pulling against the system while it's in a passive state. To push is to confront. To pull is to manipulate. Modern stealth games are built around systemic manipulation. The player is dropped into what is essentially a harmonious and fully functioning system. They can divert, twist and in some cases subdue the system at any number of vulnerable points. Players can pull bits and pieces of the system into new configurations that enable them to make progress and achieve whatever victory conditions have been set out for them. The player is still contending with the video game system, but the stealth game conditions them to do so in a more considered, deliberate way. It does this by emphasising a pull and push power dynamic between the player and the system. Let's look at enemy guards as an example. These are the most visible tools the stealth game system has at its disposal, and are usually one of the more difficult components for developers to design. I've talked in previous videos about how guards can have multiple states of awareness, but these can all be grouped into the two key system states of passive and active. While in passive states of awareness, enemies are susceptible to manipulation by the player. There are stealth games that allow enemy guards to be drawn or pulled around the game space, using mechanisms like sound or visual cues to lure them away from their baseline positions or prevent them from detecting the player. Some stealth games allow the player to neutralise passive guards in a quick and quiet fashion that won't alert the wider system to their presence. Others may offer the means to bypass guards altogether, or even take full control of them. If a guard is triggered into an active state of awareness, the scope for player manipulation narrows considerably, depending on how the guards in any given stealth game react. Typically, players will be up against a hostile enemy and be forced to either retreat or to disable their foe, if neutralisation is possible. Again, I should point out that I'm speaking in general terms. Not all stealth games allow players to neutralise guards. The marvellous mistake casts players as art museum burglars who have to rely on careful movement, gadgets and distraction, rather than the use of brute force. Not all stealth games have enemies that can detect the player using sound. The Swindle features robotic guards that are ignorant of the player's explosive changes to the game space. Not all stealth games have enemies that will engage the player in combat upon being triggered into an active state. Trilby, The Art of Theft, has security guards who sound the alarm, but then start shaking in fear rather than giving chase to the player. The nuances of how the player can pull and how the system can push are up to the developer, but the lessons remain the same. Through their interactions with guards alone, stealth game players will quickly learn two key aspects of their relationship with the system. One, that the system's push dynamics are more powerful than the player's when the system is in an active state, and two, that the player's pull dynamics are only effective when the system is in a passive state. I don't know if I can say this for other genres, but in a stealth game, there is no power balance. When the system is passive, the power shifts in the player's favour. When the system is active, the power shifts in the system's favour. This constant flow of fluidic power between the player and the system is what makes stealth games so interesting to me and many other enthusiasts of the genre. A passive, yielding system can turn into an active, deadly system if the player is not careful.
Their vulnerability and the need to conserve precious resources is an evolving concern with each new space they penetrate and each new obstacle they encounter. A common measurement of player skill is whether or not they can complete a section of a stealth game without being detected by, or interfering with, the system. To become a ghost, to disappear under the radar, to move through the shadows, these are the power fantasies of the stealth gamer. It's also important to recognise that the majority of players just want an interesting power dynamic where they can manipulate the passive system in a particular way and enjoy the thrill of avoiding capture or defeat by an active system. I would argue that stealth game developers need to ask themselves two questions when designing their game's power dynamic. To what extent can the player pull against the system and exercise their power, and to what extent can the system push against the player and punish them for being detected? By determining the answers to those questions, a stealth game designer can achieve a kind of power balance between player and system, but it's a balance that's determined by the designer themselves rather than an objective truth. Player tolerance for a given stealth game's pull and push dynamic will vary to be sure, and you're never going to satisfy every stealth game enthusiast. We have a broad spectrum of preferences, right down to whether or not it's okay to kill guard characters in stealth games that offer both lethal and non-lethal takedown mechanisms. Some of us want a stealth game with a truly punishing system, others are happy to have a degree of flexibility where escape or even holding off an active system are possible. From the thrill of successfully manipulating the system to the dread of being detected and attacked by enemies, the power balance between player pull and system push can be used to create very different stealth game experiences. So don't worry too much about what players want if you happen to be building a stealth game. Instead, create a power dynamic between player pull and system push that resonates with and works for you. The chances are that many of us will enjoy what it has to offer.